what is the second uh, parameter that we can uh, obtain the second parameter which we are going to get is what is called as a peak time pp okay so what is the peak time the peak time is that instant of time at which the output reaches the first peak of its overshoot okay this is tp okay so the peak time of the underdamped second order system is the instant of time at which the output response or response reaches the first peak okay as far as overshoot is concerned okay so obviously you see that the output value is the maximum for all time right at peak time is it not because in the second peak you see that the output at the second peak is lower than the first peak because you have a decaying exponential multiplying the cos and sin terms right so the output of the first peak is going to be the maximum value then how can i get peak time differentiate that expression equated to zero then solve then minimum means okay any other step ah okay what do you do you get the second derivative and see it's negative right for maximum right we need to do those two steps see here why are those two steps important here you have a graphical uh, interpretation so what he says makes sense right see here i have drawn the graph suppose if i didn't draw the graph and i ask you to find the maxima right what do you will do you will differentiate it once equate the first derivative to zero solve then you take the second derivative and substitute the roots for which the first derivative was zero and find out whether the second derivative was negative or positive right if it's negative it was a maxima right positive means it's a minima right so please uh, do that okay so let's do this so why don't you do dy dt equals zero okay i i have to keep track of this i think it would have been better if i have I'm seeing this. Okay, so I'm going to write here. You please independently do it. Am I correct? Right. The cos omega d terms, uh, d t <coughs> terms cancel off each other. Right. The plus and the minus. So I am only left with the sin omega d t term, and this once again like a times b times c equals zero. Right. E power minus zeta omega t once once again not zero because peak time is finite, and the term within the square bracket is also not zero because it's positive. 
right. So, what can be 0? sin omega d t is 0. So, that means that uh, the solution for this thing is n pi by t t right. Obviously, n equals 0 does not make sense right. So, we say n equals 1, 2, 3 and so on ok. So, that is what we have oh, sorry uh, n pi by omega d right sorry correct. Now, of course, you need to calculate the second derivative. So, d squared y t d t squared uh, is going to be uh, let us put this uh, constant term out say then what we are going to have is that we are we will first differentiate the exponential term. And then uh, we differentiate the sign term. So, what can you say about the second derivative at uh, t equals uh, n pi? At t equals n pi, the first term is gone, right? Second term will be some exponential which is going to be positive right times cos n pi ok. For what value of n will be cos pi uh, uh, will be negative the first value is n equals 1 right cos pi is minus 1 right is it not. I hope it is clear what I am doing right. I took the second derivative this is a constant term ok then I, I just uh, differentiated why does this first term uh, vanish at t equals <coughs> n pi by omega d uh, the second derivative just becomes omega d uh, plus zeta squared omega n divided by square root of 1 minus zeta squared multiplied by first term vanishes because it becomes sin pi right that is gone that is 0. So, we get e power uh, minus zeta omega n n pi by omega d ok that is a finite number anyway ok times omega d times cos n pi. Now, we see that for n equals 1 the second derivative becomes negative see for n equals 0 or 2 or something like that the second derivative is positive right. So, that that take that indicates a local minimum right. So, for n equals 1 you know like the second derivative is negative. So, that is a maxima and from our argument we see that that is the global maxima for this particular function right. So, as a result the peak time is going to be equal to pi by omega d. Okay, is it clear how we got pi by omega d as the peak time right. Now, the third parameter is what is called as maximum peak overshoot ok. What is this maximum peak overshoot ok. So, immediately we see that this value is y at t p right. This 1 I can write as y at infinity right because as t tends to infinity what is the value of y right at steady state value. Now, uh, what is the maximum uh, peak overshoot what do you mean by overshoot overshoot is the value beyond which the output uh, what to say uh, goes over the steady state value right this is an overshoot right is it not. Now, the question that we are asking ourselves is uh, by how much am I overshooting the final value to the maximum possible extent. So, that means that I should first look at this number right what is y at t p minus y at infinity right that is the maximum overshoot right that I am having. So, this maximum peak overshoot m p is defined as 
y at t p minus y at infinity typically normalized by the final value and by and large indicated as a percentage measure. Okay, that is how it is given. Right. So, now what is y at t p? You substitute uh, uh, t p equals pi by omega d into this expression. What do you get? We get 1 minus e power minus zeta omega and pi by omega d cos pi, right? That is minus 1, then this guy is 0. So, immediately we see that y at tp is going to be equal to 1 plus e power minus zeta omega and pi by omega d. Do you agree? How we got this? Let me repeat this once again. If you go to this expression and substitute t equals pi by omega d, the second term vanishes, right? Because you get sin pi. First term you get cos pi, cos pi is minus 1, so minus and minus becomes plus. You get e power minus zeta omega and pi by omega d, right? So that is what we get here. And this I can rewrite it as 1 minus, sorry, 1 plus e power minus zeta pi divided by square root of 1 minus zeta square. Why? Because omega d is omega n times square root of 1 minus zeta square, right? I use the definition of the damped natural frequency, okay? In this case, y at infinity is 1. So, what will I have? I have the maximum peak overshoot to be equal to 1 plus e power minus pi zeta divided by square root of 1 minus zeta square that is y at t p minus 1 divided by 1 multiplied by 100 percent. So, maximum peak overshoot will be e power minus zeta pi divided by square root of 1 minus zeta square times 100 percent. Okay. So, if, if someone says you know damping ratio is 10 percent, that means that e power <coughs> minus zeta pi by square root of 1 minus zeta square is 0.1, okay? that is how it should be interpreted. And immediately we can see that as uh, zeta increases, m p decreases, right? so, so that is a counter, uh, uh, there is a trade off that you have. See, we already saw that as zeta increases, the rise time increases, right? The system becomes slower, but the advantage is that the peak overshoot reduces. Why is that important? Because peak overshoot is indicative of by what magnitude my, does my output exceed the final value. See, just imagine this. Let us say if you open a door which is automatically closing and then you pull it, you enter and then you leave it you may see that it is oscillating. Ideally, do you want the oscillations to be very high or uh, as small as possible? As small as possible, right? Because like we do not want to hit the next person, right? Then what will I do? I will essentially ensure that my damping is large. But if I make the damping large, you will observe that it takes longer for the door to close. That is indicative of rise time. So, you would observe that in many doors, you know like if you want fast closure, the oscillations will be larger, right? Because they will make the damping to be smaller, right? But then the price that we pay is that the oscillations are larger in magnitude. But if I do not want these oscillations or I want the oscillations to be smaller, the price I need to pay is that I need to compromise on the rise time, okay? So, rise time and peak overshoot are two conflicting uh, requirements and considering these requirements by and large, this is just a rule of thumb, by and large we design second order systems with damping ratios between 0.4 and 0.8, okay. This is no, this is just a once again a rule of thumb, okay, which is a common control design practice, you know like by and large we want to design underdamped second order systems that have damping ratios between 0.4 and 0.8. We do not want damping ratios lower than 0.4 because the overshoot will be very high, okay, although the rise time will be very small. We do not want damping ratios beyond 0.8 because the system will be sluggish. 
the overshoot will be low, but then rise time will be high. Then the system's response takes a longer time. Okay, so that is the trade-off. Okay, between rise time and peak overshoot. Is it clear? Okay. So uh, the last uh, parameter which I'm going to touch upon is settling time. This I'm going to leave it to your homework. I'm just going to give you the expressions. You figure out how we got them. Okay, the settling time. Once again, it's the time taken for the output to settle within a band, right? So, if you take a plus or minus 2 percent band, the expression for settling time is 4 divided by zeta omega n. If you take a 5 percent band, the settling time is plus 3 by zeta omega n. Okay? By default, in this course, if I say settling time, we are dealing with the 2 percent band. Okay? So, in all uh, problems that we are going to do in this particular course, if ever I talk about settling time, you must automatically consider 2 percent band. So, that means that the settling time for a second order system, <coughs> under amp second order system will be 4 by zeta omega n, settling time for a first order system will be 4 times time constant. Okay? That is the settling time we are going to use in this particular course. Is it clear? So, how did we get this expression? I leave it as homework. Okay? We derived for 3 expressions. That is uh, what were uh, peak time, rise time and peak overshoot, settling time, you please do it. So once again, how do we visualize settling time? Let me go back to this graph. Let us say I take the 2 percent band. What happens is that I, I draw the upper band, uh, upper uh, limit and the lower limit, okay, using this pink uh, dotted line and then you figure out what is the time after which the output settles to within this band, right? That is my setting time. Is it clear? I hope it is graphically also clear as to what we define by settling time, right? So, these are the four parameters that we do, okay? So, these four parameters are uh, based upon the transient response of underdamped, stable, second order linear time invariant causal systems. Okay? So, these are typical parameters that will be uh, specified okay? like when we want to specify the uh, responses. Is it clear? Yeah. Settling time is the first peak after, after the second. Not, not first peak per se, you know like what you can say is that it is the first instance after which the output settles within the band. See, for example, let us say the output settles here, you know, like just go one, one delta t ahead and that is your settling time, right? So, it is where the plus 2 percent intersects the… Yeah. So, uh, see, the, uh, the thing is, what is the first instant of time, you know, like after which uh, what is the, uh, no part of the output touches the band, okay? That is how you would determine, okay? We are going to come there. Okay, so okay. His question was then, yeah. Uh, one minute. Let me come uh, one question at a time. His question was then, uh, are these parameters uh, uh, common for even other types of systems? Okay, I'm going to answer that. Okay, as we go along in the design process. The uh, the let me preemptively give you the reason. The reason why either time constant or these parameters are used is because once again the dominant dynamics that you typically find even in higher order systems either corresponds to a first order system or an underdamp second order system. What do we mean by that is that dominant poles will be either a pair of complex conjugate poles or a pole on the real axis, which corresponds to either a underdamp second order system or a first order system respectively. That is why we use this. Of course, it is one approximation, but it is a useful approximation nonetheless. Okay? Yes, please. Yeah, I just indicated qualitatively, okay. If you want to zoom in and uh, do this, you know, like, uh, so, uh, see, this is the place where it comes out, right. I just put it immediately afterwards. Uh, see, I do not know how, how to zoom in, right. Let us see whether it, uh, see, oops, I do not know what I did. Okay, uh, but, but you get the picture, right. So, uh, see, this is where 
it, I just do a freehand sketch, right? So, but you can see that this is a place where it last touches it, the pink line just to the right of it. Okay, that's settling time. Okay, yeah. The the idea is that like after the settling time point, you know, the the output should remain within the band. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Fine. So now that we have looked at underdamp second order uh, systems. Uh, uh, let's uh, qualitatively plot uh, the step response of uh, the three class of systems and then like I am going to leave you with a homework problem, okay. So let's do this. So if I plot uh, y of t versus t and we are looking at the unit step response of the three class of systems, right? We are looking at the unit uh, step response. Okay, of the three categories of systems. So, if you have an underdamped second order system, what's going to happen is that the output is going to be something like this. Okay, oscillatory, and then it will settle down, right? So, of course, if one exact. Oops, I don't want to erase the entire thing. But you get the point, right? It will oscillate like this. If we had a critically damp, so this is an underdamped system. Okay, if we had a critically damped system, what's going to happen is that the output is going to start like this, and it's going to essentially never going to oscillate. Okay, never going to cross one. Okay, but it will monotonically tend to the final value. So, a critically damped system has no overshoot, but it is the fastest among second order systems without any overshoot. Okay? On the other hand, if you consider an overdamped system, an overdamped system will be extremely sluggish. Okay? So, okay, not a great diagram. Okay? Let me, let me draw a nice smooth curve. Okay, it is it's going to be extremely sluggish. Okay, so we hardly design overdamp systems. Okay, so suppose if you do not want critically, uh, sorry, if you do not want oscillations, see for example, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, see uh, to give an example, you know, like in an uh, if you want to prevent collisions between vehicles, right. If you have two vehicles following each other, you do not want the vehicle spacing to oscillate like an underdamp system, right? Do not, would you, right? See, you do not want to be in a vehicle which is traveling behind another vehicle and it coming and going forward and backwards suddenly, right? When it is stopping, you want a smooth, nice motion, right? So then, but then like you also would want the system to act as fast as possible. So you have two conflicting requirements. Then what you do is that you design as if it is a critically damp second order system. But of course, as I told you, critically damp second order system means zeta is exactly 1 and in real life, it is very difficult to make it exactly equal to 1, okay. We will see when you design, right. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, like uh, if you make zeta to be greater than 1, uh, practically, you know, like it is going to be very sluggish, okay. I am sure you would have seen many of these automatic closing doors, right. You open it, it will close ever so slowly, right. That means that it is overdamped, okay. It is very sluggish. Okay, the damping ratio is extremely high because what is damping ratio? C divided by 2 square root of mk, right, for first 1 degree of freedom linear motion, right. So, you see that if the damping ratio is very high, things will be very sluggish, right. So, uh, that is an overdamp system, okay. So, uh, by as I told you, by and large, we are going to design uh, as control designers, we would be in by and large. Okay, once again, there are, can always be exceptions. I told you one exception, right? By and large, we we ha, we design underdamp systems with damping ratios between 0.4 and 0.8. Okay, that's just a rule of thumb. Okay, there is no hard and fast rule that this is the only way to design uh, control systems. No. Okay. Yeah. So what I am going to uh, leave you with are uh, two homeworks. Okay. First. Uh, find the unit step response of critically damped and over damped 
systems. Okay, second, find the unit impulse response of underdamped critically damped and over damped second order systems. Of course, it goes without saying that we are dealing with second order systems. Okay, so that is what we I want you to do. Okay, so please uh, do these uh, two exercises. Okay, uh, and uh, so this uh, essentially uh, gives a broad overview of uh, uh, wh what we wanted to look at in the systems block, right? As I told you, right? Uh, so starting tomorrow, what I will do is that I will pr provide you with an overview of what options are available in the controller block before we go for further analysis. Okay, so that is what uh, we are going to do uh, tomorrow, right. Uh, 